are you a book reader or so like myself it's hard for me to read man. yeah yeah <laughs> this is gonna be crazy to say it right now a lot of people gonna be like what the f like, but i've only read one book my entire life what was it bro so it was holes oh, the, the remember the movie yeah. holes <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Keys of Currency, where we interview high-level entrepreneurs doing high-level things. Today, I got a very special guest. This young man is somebody who is a community leader, do very special things in his community, someone who specializes in consumer finance. I have my friend, Mr. Umar Clark. Umar, how are you doing, man? I'm well, bro. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate you joining us on the show, man. Thank you, bro. I'm excited about this podcast bro because i've been watching what you've been doing right you've been somebody who's been a leader in your community you've been somebody who's been a leader for the people you've been bringing a lot of awareness been no cap in your game man and you're really helping people get out of financial situations that they feel like they're obligated to Mm. but before we really get into all that stuff man can you please introduce yourself and give a little, give a little bit of a background about who you are? Okay. Uh, my name is Umar Clark. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama. I grew up literally all over the world from um, Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, Damascus, Syria, Saudi Arabia. Um, my father was like a real nomadic person. So, you know, he'd get a hunch and we'd be out. Mm. Um, quick story just about that to kind of show you how that type of person my father is. Me and my brother had a fight. And we had a fight in front of people who weren't family. My father was big on you never, uh, family never fights in front of people who aren't family. So we had a fight. Most parents would just put you on punishment or maybe even beat you. He packed our bags up and moved us to Damascus, Syria, me and my brother, and left us there. So you lived in another country? Another country, yep. Wow. So people don't know I can read and write Arabic, right? Oh, wow. Because of that. So we lived there and we had no choice but to stick together. So until this day, me and my brother are really close because of that situation. So that's just kind of like a, saying that to kind of give a background on kind of how I grew up. Um, from there, um, we still moved a lot. So, you know, I went to high school in about two or three different states. I never I dropped out of high school. Um, and then I spent time as a shepherd down in Alabama. Okay. And so that's kind of like where my love for animals and stuff comes from. It's like I was a shepherd. If, I, if, you, if you ask me what my trade is, I wouldn't even tell you it was consumer law. I would say it was being a shepherd. Um, once I'm, um, once I'm kind of out of the influencer space, that's kind of what I want to do when I get older is just sit back with my sheep again, but that's me. Nice, man. So with the journey that you've been on, bro, like you're, you're an entrepreneur, right? Yes, sir. What got you into the whole entrepreneurial world? Um, number one, when I kind of realized that, you know, no matter what you do in life, you're in business. Mm. You know, if I get a job, it's, I'm still an entrepreneur because, you know, when you sit down at that job interview, I don't know if people notice this, they always ask you, what salary do you want? Right. It's business. Right. Yeah. So once I realized that the, the, the biggest restriction is, you know, when you're when you're doing when you're an entrepreneur for somebody else, you no longer control your time. Mm. But most people like the safety of that. You know, I know when that check is coming. Right. Um, what really pushed me to completely go the entrepreneurship route was I got a job at uh, Norfolk Southern. And you know, Norfolk Southern starts off at $30 an hour, no degree. Oh, wow. And that's like a big deal, but you're sitting there 12 hours a day and you can't leave unless you're relieved. So if that person never shows up, guess what? You're going to work 24 hours that day. Oh, wow. And it's completely legal in the railroad industry. Um, And I had my son was, my my son's mother went into labor and she texted me, she called me, said, I'm going to labor, I'm, I'm rushing to the hospital. Okay. And I went to the manager and said, hey, my son's in born. Can I leave? He said, no, I don't have nobody to relieve you. So I packed up my stuff and left. And I said, no, I, I, there's no way. Like you, some, The fact somebody can tell me I can't be there when my son is born, mm-hmm. I can't live like that. You didn't like that control? Not at all. So from that moment on, I was like, I was pretty bad at it. Um, and uh, we struggled. We struggled intensely. But I was an entrepreneur since then. So when, when you made that decision... Right. To go to work for yourself, make money by yourself. What was it that you chose to do? Um, From there, what I did was, um, and even though me and my son's mother are on the best of terms, she'll still corroborate this story. I told her, I said, take me to the dealership. My credit was horrible. I said, take me to a dealership and don't come back and get me. 
Mm. She says, well, what? I said, I'm leaving here with a van. I was I started a um, cargo van business. I was moving uh, auto parts for Auto Nation. I got a contract with Auto Nation. Um, and I said, I said, don't come back and get me. She said, what do you mean? I said, drop me off. Don't come back to me. I was there for nine hours. I left with a van. Interest rate was insane. Um, but I, I pulled off the lot with a, a, a Ram Promaster, 2017 Ram Promaster 1500. I actually still have that van. Wow. Yeah. So what did that turn into? Um, the first few, I missed the first two car payments on that car. I'm saying that to say I struggle. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that, that dealership instance taught me a lesson. You know, and this is actually something I learned from watching a child. You ever watch a child um, when they want something, they're going to cry until they get it. Yeah. When we become adults, we're too embarrassed to do that, but I'm not. So what I did was I was at the dealership getting the van serviced and I was watching the manager yell at um, he was yelling at somebody about the parts not being there on time. Mm. So I'm like, I'm like, what is, what is he? Yelling? It, does, it didn't make sense to me, but I yeah. heard him say something like, if only we can get these parts the same day clicked. So, um, the next day I came back and I just spoke to him. I'm like, where do the parts come? He said, they come out of door. The tires come out of Doraville and the bumpers come out of Marietta or something. I said, well, I can, I, I, I didn't have the guy. So well, me and my guys can uh, go, it was just me can go pick these parts up for you yeah. before I knew it. We had the contract and I had all my friends from my community moving this stuff. So that was like your start into the entrepreneurial world was I've been, that's like, I would say that was the, when I made the jump from hustler to businessman, because before that I was in entrepreneurship but it was just me, so I was just a hustler. Maybe I might sell, you know, I was selling true detergent before they got big. Um, I didn't, before then, I don't like to count it too much because I didn't feel like I was doing business because I, you know, I lost out on so much because um, paperwork wasn't, I didn't know the importance of paperwork and stuff like that. Yeah. So the, getting into the logistics business and actually having people work under me, I learned the importance of paperwork and everything you do. Gotcha. So when I started my entrepreneurial journey, bro, like, I just kind of jumped out there. Mm. It was like a sink or swim situation. Wow. And with that, because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't have any kind of like financial literacy. Wow. Right. And when I jumped out there, I was using credit mm. to cover finances, to get, you know, tools for the business, wow. for the business. And because I was not financially literate, messed my credit up, mm. tore it up. Mm. Did you have like that same kind of experience when you Hell jumped yeah. out there? Hell yeah. Better yet, um, I had got into breeding dogs one time. Bullies. Uh, not the pocket bullies, but there's like, you know, the medium sized ones. Mm-hmm. And I remember one of this, I had uh, the guy actually let me pay. He didn't even know me, but he liked my hustle. So he, he gave me this dog um, and she was off an amazing bloodline. And he, uh, her dad's name was Crybaby. You can actually still look him up. He was like, oh, he's a really big deal in the bully community. And um, he gave me the dog and he let me pay monthly. Mm. Right. And the day I got the dog, I'm all excited. She didn't know me. She was an adult dog. And she got out of the cage in the garage and ran out and got hit by a car. Oh, no. She didn't die, but her hips broke. So I took her to the vet. They said, you can't breed this dog. Even if we do the surgery, you can't breed her. Wow. So maybe an hour later, the lady came back like she's no way to sit. Now she hasn't turned up real bleeding. We got to put her down, and um, they put her down, and they were like, "That's one hundred and seventy five dollars." I did not have the money to pay that. So they like, "That's uh, my car was maxed out." So they said, um, "Well, all right, you can get care credit." This is when I first figured out what care credit was. I said, all right, "I knew my credit." My I had cre- that same thing, right? Bro, care credit. And it was a f- my credit was a five something, so care credit denied me. Mm. Somehow that card swiped. I don't know if that particular card at the time. Um, just allowed me to, it was God. That's all I can really say. Yeah. Like the, the card was maxed out, but it's still swiped. Mm. But saying that to say, that's how bad my credit was at the time. Yeah. So, so many entrepreneurs get in that position, man. It's like they go out there, they take that leap of faith, they start their own business. And because they don't have that guaranteed income, they're just living off of credit and they're maxing out credit cards, right? right. And then you got the CRAs who are seeing that. And if you got a $10,000 limit or $5,000 limit, and they see that you're at that threshold, all of a sudden your credit is shot, right? right? And a lot of times what we end up doing as people is we stop paying on it. We just say, you know what? F that credit card. I'm not paying it. I can't afford it right now. I don't care what happens to my credit. And so what happens is we start going through this like financial struggle, right? Mm. To where now we can't go get a house if we want to because our credit's messed up. We can't go get a a car where they got an interest rate. We're going to have to do everything cash. And everyone feels like 
they're in prison, so to speak, when it comes to their credit. Mm. And they feel like they're in that 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 prison for like the next seven years. Right. That's how long it stays on your credit for. Right. So to the people that are not aware of consumer law and their rights, right? What got you in to really indulging about credit and consumer law? I was tired of, you know, you just explained the situation to a T, bro. Um, I didn't like the fear that was associated with debt. Mm-hmm. I didn't like the control. Like I get a letter in the mail and be afraid to open it. Or when I did open it, it was like I had many heart attacks. Um, people not consider suicide because I was so deep in debt at one point. Mm. Right. I was working at Delta Airlines and I remember I, t- I had my son and his mother fly up to affiliate. And she didn't even know that's why I had them do that. Wow. It was just too much. And so, but for me, I always felt like there's no way that like pieces of paper can beat us down like this. It just didn't make sense. Like how? Yeah. Right. So there was always a feeling in me like, you know, like there's a way out of this. Um, and so I just, you know, I would look at letters and they on there would mention laws. And, and you know, I'm, I'm I've always been a curious person. Um, and so, like, I would just read. And I'm a person when I learn something, I'm not a person that learns by reading. I got to go fail at it. Like, I have mm-hmm. to. It's not even a uh, like, you know, people like to Google my dismissed uh, lawsuits and stuff. Because I just, you know, if I figure something out, I'm going for it until right. I figure it out. So, I just started sending just anything I could find off. If I made something up, I might even make laws up at the time. Just trying to figure out what is this they're talking about. Like on there, they, you know, if, if you ever got a letter from a debt collector, on the letter they'll say, pursuant to the FDCPA, you have uh, 30 days to dispute the validity of this debt or we'll assume it's valid. And I, I will read the word assume and I'd be like, that's an assumption. I can assume I'm the president. It doesn't make me the president. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to say it's not mine. Sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't. But when I started to like actually read this thing and I start figuring out who controls them, who governs them, what strikes fear in them, the way they strike and fear in us, what really hit me, one of the biggest turning points was when I realized that there's a law in place to protect us from them. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's no law in place for them to be protected from us, meaning like we can do whatever we want to them. If I want to call them every morning at 9 a.m., nobody can tell me I can't, but they can't do that to us. That's when I realized they were powerless. It was like, you know, if you ever, um, this is the analogy I always like to give. My dad worked at the circus and they would tie the elephants to a stick and they wouldn't move. Mm. But the way they got the elephant like that was tying them to a tree. So he spent a year tied to a tree. Now everything that resembles a tree, I mean, that resembles that tree is a tree to him, even if it's a twig. Oh, wow. So if you ever watch this, if you ever go, uh, if you ever uh, ride by the circus, look at the small things they had elephants tied to. And that's what they were doing to us the entire time. Man, so... When it comes to consumer law, bro, like you really started to to learn about it, right? How did you get to the point where you're at today? Because when I hear you speak of this stuff, I I look at it like, man, this dude's been doing this stuff for like decades. Because you know this stuff to a T. Yeah. And like, where did you really gain the passion for that? Like, what what made you get to a point where you're like, listen, I got to learn this not just for me, but for the people. Um, I always had a passion for love, bro. That was that's love is my real passion, and I seen consumer law as a um, as a way to love people, and the reason why I saw it with that was everybody was in debt. It was just like everybody I knew was going through the same thing, um, and so like you know um, where I got now came from absolute failure. Mm. Every single thing you see is from just. I'm just not a person that I've never been afraid to fail. So like, I'm just diving head first into stuff, especially things I'm afraid of. Like I was afraid to send off lawsuits because I didn't know anything. Um, I was afraid to send off letters to the bureau. I didn't know nothing. I was afraid to call them, but um, it just did it. So what you see now is just a culmination of uh, facing fear in public failures and, mm-hmm. and reading. So, I mean, like what, what is consumer law, bro? Because, when I talk to other credit specialists, people that claim they can fix your credit, right? They want to do stuff like, say, it's not my debt. Um, or the typical things that you hear what credit specialists do. You have a very unique approach to this stuff. Yeah. You, you don't actually do credit repair, right? Actually, coming soon, I'm going to do something where we do free credit repair for everybody. Okay. Yeah. So that's important right there. Yeah. But what you guys really specialize in is teaching people the laws, teaching yep. people their rights, right? Yep. So what are the, like the key things that like people need to, to know when it comes to consumer law to really help themselves get out of that financial situation to where they feel like they're obligated to pay that debt? Okay, so one of the most important things people should know, 
Um, Because there's this misconception because of the power experience changing and Equifax have. There's a misconception that they're like a government entity. Mm. What people should know is they're a public company like Walmart. So this Mm. means, you know, there's actually over now, um, if you go on the CFPB website, there's over 300 consumer reporting agencies. People only know about TransUnion, Experian, Equifax. But one of the most important things people should know to kind of relieve yourself of that burden of being afraid to attack them is that anybody, you can Google how to start a consumer reporting agency. Anybody can do it. Now, what comes with that is, you know, if you read the beginning of the FCRA, they tell us that TransUnion, that the government didn't have, like, the government's so afraid of the liability that comes with people thinking the government has something to do with allowing this, that they tell you at the beginning of the law that they have nothing to do with this. They assume this role. Mm. Better yet, they go as far as saying they assume the vital role. Vital meaning, like, life or death. And it is life or death because if somebody has a bad credit score, they consider suicide. Or, you know, you can't, you, your livelihood is dependent on this thing. And that's extremely dangerous when you have a public company, right, that's making billions and billions on your name and make and making completely control your livelihood. So that would be as far as the um, eight, you know, most people call them credit bureaus, which is fine. I don't like to call them that because a bureau is a is like uh, is is the FBI. Right. Right. It's so more like a government entity. government entity. So the reason why they use World Bureau is so you associate them with the government, mm. but they have nothing to do with the government. But um, they're supposed to be called consumer reporting agency. So I would say, number one, on that consumer reporting agency side, um, I would say understand that they're just a publicly traded company like everybody else. Walmart, uh, Costco. Right. Mm. For debt collectors. Um, you know, if you ever notice when they call you, they never say you owe it. They ask you if you owe it. So once you agree. Now they can assume that you owe it, right? Yeah. And then when it comes to creditors, it's all about informed use, right? You, they can't just give you a generic agreement that they printed out. That's not legal, mm. right? They ha- it has to be, cons- uh, the losses has to be clear and conspicuous, meaning whoever's reading this can completely understand what they agreed to. So, uh, so we gave three things. One, for the consumer reporting agencies, it has to be, um, you have to understand that they're just a publicly traded company. Debt collectors understand the debt doesn't exist until you make it exist. Mm -hmm. And then for creditors, it's all about informed use and you understanding what you agreed to. So these debt collectors, bro, like they can be a pain in the ass. For sure. Right. (laughs) And what I've learned from you is that you can actually sue the shit out of them. Yeah. Because what I've also learned is what they're doing a lot of times is completely illegal. (laughs) Completely. They're, They're buying this debt. From like, let's say you you had an agreement with, I don't know, some local bank. Yeah. The local bank's not getting paid for you no more, so they sell the debt, Mm. right? And then these debt collectors feel like they've got (laughs) all this power to come after you, start threatening you, and saying they're going to seize this and seize that and just scare the living shit out of you and start taking money from you. And that's actually illegal. Right. Right. So, again, man, you're the first one that I've ever heard has been like, hey, Listen, that shit's completely illegal. Yeah. (laughs) And you can go after these people. So what are ways, like some tactics, like, you know, give me like two things that I can do to get a debt collector completely off of my back. Um, They've sent you a letter in the mail or they, okay. Uh, Number one, 1692G is your best friend. Get them. uh, And and this doesn't have, you know, normally when people say it, I think you have to sound like an attorney. I'm not an attorney. Right. Right. So this is just all consumer law. All this consumer is all law. free information. Right, free information. And so, but people always want to, you know, people, all, what do they call it? Analysis paralysis. It's like, yep. you know, they hear it and now they want to, you know, you just started today. You're not going to get it perfect. It's just for the viewers. Right. So the first thing I would do is you got to validate this. Mm-hmm. And I'm not only asking that for your sake, I'm asking that because I want to see what information you have on me. And okay. the reason why I'm saying that is because if you purchase, if me and you did a business deal, and let's say I have an NDA in there, right? And then this guy over here knows everything we did. You're just a fringe upon my right to privacy. Mm. So what I'm getting at is if I have a car with the local bank and it charges off, following hard times like everybody does, COVID, whatever, and then this debt collector buys it, you want to buy the debt? Cool, but you can't buy my information. Mm. So what I'm actually doing when I ask for validation, I'm trapping you. All right. You think I'm trying to get you to validate the debt when I'm just trying to get you to prove that you're infringing upon my right to privacy. So when I sue you, I'm getting you for infringing upon my right to privacy. Oh, wow. Right. Uh, you said two. So that was one. Two, um, you want to immediately, you know, after you get all the information you want from them, cease and desist, 6092C. All that says is stop communicating with me. Right. Now, a lot of people don't know. People think that communication just means a call or email or a letter in the mail. But the, one of the biggest forms of communication, when a law defines communication, it says uh, the conveying of information through any medium. 
your credit report is a medium of communication. So if you send a cease and desist and you tell them stop communicating with me and it's still being reported, you have them on two things. They violated a cease and desist and they infringed upon your right to privacy two times because they reported this to an unaffiliated third party, which is Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, and they had they purchased your information without your consent. So if we've caught them in, you know, in the act and doing some illegal activity, like what are some remedies that we can get? Can we get a paycheck from them? For sure. Like, can you elaborate on so that? So it, uh, it depends. You know, a lot of people are afraid to sue, and it's actually really simple. Mm-hmm. You know, most people are afraid of people seeing that they, a case got dismissed. You're not a lawyer. You know, you gotta, you're going to have to fail at it and figure it out, right? Yeah. But um, you can sue. Um, when Renee started doing what I love, which made it easier on a lot of our files, she started arbitrating with the debt collectors, right? Okay. So you don't even have to sue anymore. People are getting checks without even having to sue. So you have two routes. Um, some people have gotten crafty enough to get them that, you know, I have a student named Z out in Detroit. Um, this is something uh, that's really amazing to me. She's gotten so good that she'll get you to pay them without suing or arbitration. She'll just show you we violated, violated the law. And she's gotten multiple checks that way. What, what do you mean by like arbitrating? When you say so, arbitration is like where you'll get it. They'll get an unaffiliated third party, like a um, attorney or something, mm-hmm. and they'll act as a judge. Pay pretty much to, in layman's terms, they'll act as a judge outside of court. Okay, right. So this is without having to go to court. Okay, and a lot gotcha. of people like that because they just don't. The idea of going to court scares people, which I understand. Okay, now do you feel with now people like you? And what I've noticed is more people are coming out. Yeah, and they're starting to teach the whole consumer law stuff, right? Yeah. Again, you're the first one that I've, I've actually seen that's taught it to a T and actually knows this stuff to the fullest. And a lot more people are starting to follow in those footsteps and they've learned it from you. I almost look at you like the pioneer of consumer <laughs> law, man. Um, what I've noticed or what I hear is like it's getting tougher because the CRAs are starting to catch on. For sure. To these methods. And a lot of people just end up you know, throwing in the towel and giving up and going back to like, man... I'm just going to have to wait, you know, until seven years until it falls off. Yeah. But just like anything in life, it's like, I don't think they understand like consistency is Word. key, bro. Like Word. you can't just try like one time and expect that thing to fall off. Right? Impossible. Yeah. So, I mean, like, what do you feel like is the common mistakes that like once the people kind of learn the information, what do you feel like as the, the people, like what mistakes are they making when it comes to not being able to deal with debt collectors or get stuff off of their credit report? I would say the biggest mistake I see people making is the templates. Mm. And the reason why it's an issue is like, you know, if um, in the medical industry, if somebody has a disease um, and you keep giving them the same medicine, eventually that disease gets immune to that medicine. Yeah. So if, 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 and they actually, uh, my friend Jesse actually had a, a, a actual debt collector on his podcast and they corroborated this. When they keep seeing the same letter, they just automatically mark in the computer verify. So people will see one person have success off of one letter from their situation and everybody wants to use that same letter. Right. And that was actually something I didn't like about the books I wrote was like, I thought people were going to think outside the box and they didn't. They just ran what was in there and then they ran the well dry. Yeah. Right. So but to to kind of fix this is, you know, use the same laws, but tell your own story. Mm. It's literally that simple. Nobody. It's like it's almost like, you know, let's say me and you are dealing with the same debt collector. And I tell my story and when and you tell somebody else's story they've seen a thousand times. It's like right. it doesn't even make sense for that. It's to like work copy out. and paste. Copy and paste. All people are doing. Yeah. So the success rate went down because people just it was like the herd mentality. Nobody wanted to think outside the box anymore. Do you think like just threatening to sue is the quickest way to just like deal with them? I or? say I say actually sue because even the threatening to sue method is um, these most of these companies are outsourced, which isn't completely legal, or they're completely ran by AI. Now a lot of people don't know that, mm. so it's just pressing buttons. So even threatening to sue doesn't mean anything to an Indian or a computer. They don't live here. For instance, I was on a phone with Experian about three months ago for a friend of mine. You know, when you're the when you're when you the credit guy, everybody brings their credit yeah. stuff to you. <laughs> so I'm on the phone with the Experian, and it's an Indian, mm-hmm. and I'm giving him the law. He's like, "I'm in India. The FCRA doesn't apply to me." He's not lying. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So when you that's another thing people want to know when you call, ask for an American. Make sure they're in America. So with the phone conversations, because I you know my credit was jacked up, I was doing the whole phone <laughs> thing too. Or, 
Never got anywhere with it. <laughs> Do you recommend keeping a paper trail and doing the letter route and going through the CFPB and using as leverage? Um, my favorite thing is the CFPB because it's like it's a government agency. It's a government. You know, the CFPB and the FBI are both. Uh, you know, they're pretty much on the same level. The difference is the FBI has agents. Mm-hmm. The agents of the CFPB are us. So, what is the duty of the CFPB, though? They're just what? a. a um, if I could put it in layman's terms, just a a, um, a way to keep track of what's going on, number one. And number two, um, they're like a government middleman, but you got to understand, like, they don't actually have, like, the investigation is supposed to be done by us, which is why they have an area for you to submit your attachments mm-hmm. and say what happened. They're not investigating anything. They're just like, uh, think about it like this. Um, you, you uh, Your kid gets in trouble and the principal goes to you to get to your kid, but you don't actually discipline the kid. They're just going through you to scare the kid. Mm. Right, because there's nobody actually works for the CFPB other than us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, definitely, dude. That, that makes sense. So they're basically like just holding people accountable for sure, making sure like everything's being done to for sure on their eyes and crossing their teeth. Bingo. Bingo. Gotcha. <laughs> so, bro, I want to get into community, man. Okay. You know because I think community and relationships is going to be so crucial and key. Over these next couple of years. That thing right? you put on Instagram was extremely true. Yeah, dude. Extremely true. You know, and it's so true because the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, because the government put so much money out there, it's been easy for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right? A lot of people had to come up. Yeah. But a lot of people are about to fall off and disappear. Sure. I'm already seeing it. For sure. A lot of these gurus and influencers, you're not seeing as much content from them anymore. No. Right? And... It's because there's, there was so much cap in their game. There's no value in their yeah. game. And so we're getting ready to see who the real entrepreneurs are over these next couple of years. But community, man, I think is going to be the number one thing. For sure. What you have created, the Bureau Bullies, right? Yeah. You've created a community of people to not only lead, but understand the importance of knowing your rights mm. as a consumer, right? And I think that's just so important. But before we get into that, like, where did the whole idea blossom from when it came to creating barrel bullies? Um, being bullied by corporations that I thought were bureaus. Mm. And um, I was, you know, I love to read, bro. And um, I was reading a book one time. And um, it's, it wasn't it's not like a big book, but it was a book that was gifted to me. And it was actually in a spiral notebook. And in the book, I'm paraphrasing what was said. But he was saying how even the negatives are positive. Mm. Pretty much it, it, it kind of lines up with life doesn't happen uh, to you. It happens for you. Mm. So even the negatives in your life are positive moments. You have to just see the opportunity in making the negatives a positive. So when I'm being bullied by these bureaus, what they did was create a bureau bully. Right. Right. So once I figured things out on how to like uh, beat them at their own game, I said, I'm a, my, my, my goal when I did this, I'm going to be able to make a mil, help a million people do what I just did. Mm-hmm. So that's where the Bureau of Bullies came from. They created a monster, bro. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like you've been on stages, you've been teaching people this yeah. stuff A to Z. So when it comes to your community, man, like how many leaders do you currently have right now? In, just in my team? Yeah. Um, we just brought a few more people on. But the known individuals... Um, which is, you know, if you notice, I only bring on mostly women. Yeah. Mostly women. Um, Why is that? Oh, man, Justin, I'll give you a whole list, bro. Um, <laughs> you, I have caught on to that, bro. Yeah, notice it. A lot of people in the beginning, you know, the, the rumor was, if you notice, every one of my team is married. That's on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, You notice women cultivate everything. Mm. And they see things we don't see. So, you know, there's a lot that I don't see. You know, me... I played at my strengths and then I bring on people who are strong at what I'm weak at. Mm. What I realized, everything I was weak at, women were extremely strong at. Um, so, for instance, I'm a creative person. Um, I'm a thinker and I know how to bring people together. Oh, wow. But paperwork and um, I would say paperwork and administrative work, Renee. Yeah. Uh, putting people in check, Sophia. Controlling a room, I mean, as far as organizing, Renee again. Right. And then, you know, we need love. That's what we have Tia for. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm saying that to say, now you, you, I'm sorry, but I want a little talk. Why did I bring women on? Women cultivate everything. Um, 
they they see everything. Even as far as I'm, I'm pretty sure you can give me a million stories where there was a person you had around who was no good for you, and your wife probably told you a million times, Justin, don't deal with this person. Mm-hmm. They just had, I don't know what it is. You know, we really have to appreciate women. They just see stuff we don't see. Bro, they got like this sixth sense that they're able to just like see things. Just like you said. It's that insane. Men see. Because I think like as men, we're just so guilty of looking past certain Word. things, bro. Like Word. that only a woman's going to be able to see. Word. So I get it. And I have caught on to that with your community. Is like you got women in there. For sure. Who are leaders. And they're For very sure. good at what they do. So For sure. What is the mission right now with what the Bureau Bullies is doing? Because you guys have had events and you guys have been giving game for a couple of years now, right? So, I mean, like, where do you kind of see your community going over these next couple of years? I kind of want to change the name now. Okay. Because. Do you uh, have a, a name and like an idea right now? The Poverty Bullies. Okay. Explain it. Um, What, you know, what the Bureau Bullies, you know. What I, the, my mistake I made was I thought that everybody was thinking like me mm-hmm. in the sense that once I, you get your credit right, we're going to go build wealth. We're going to get into real estate, all kind of stuff. Everybody wasn't thinking like that. Once they beat the, the bureaus, they just went back in the same circle. Mm-hmm. Max out the, and then it was like you had the same person all over again. And a lot of that was my fault. You got to get, you don't just leave people somewhere and leave them. You lead them there and you give them direction. All right. So now, you know, the reason why I was happy to connect people like you was like, I want to teach wealth. What are you going to, now that you have this opportunity, what are you going to do with it? Right. You're going to go into real estate, uh, trucking industry is a little, it's going to need to correct itself right now, but you're going to go into trucking. Um, you know, I got into the medical industry, you're going to get into that. Like, what are you going to do now yeah. that you have this opportunity? And that's what I really, I, you know, I want to completely, you know, we talk about cancer, which is a serious disease, but poverty is the worst. Can't I believe that if people had the means, less people have cancer. People can't afford to eat good. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I think poverty is the greatest disease in every community. Yeah. Right? You think about, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, poverty even makes it hard for a man or woman to be honest. Mm. When the rent's due, how, 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 you know, and you're in a situation where you got to lie to pay the rent. Yeah. You know, how many times has people been in that situation? So if we really think about it, poverty is our, our only setback. And that's on every level, but that that's like my main focus: poverty, beating poverty. Bro, that that's so important too, man. Because it's like you said, it's like you get so many people that get the wins, they get their credit right, but they don't have those habits, More. those good habits More. of okay, how do I start creating wealth? More. Right? How do I start leveraging my credit in a positive manner? Mm. All they look at is okay. I want to go get the next shiny object or go buy some car that's above my means More. or go on some nice vacation. There's no financial literacy. there, More. So I love that, man. More. I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, I don't know if you need to change the name. In my opinion. <laughs> you, I love the you're name. saying the same thing, Renee. They're like, we're not changing the name. Well, I mean, the thing is, bro, is like you branded yourself, yeah. right? Branding is one of the hardest things to do More. in business More. period. More. And I think you guys can have, you know, can let your audience know, hey, this is what's next. This is the next step. That's true. For Bureau Boys. That's true. So I don't think you guys necessarily need to do any yeah. change. <laughs> I mean, I love the name Poverty Boy. Bullies because that could be something that could you know, turn into something big. Boy. But, bro, that's that's so true, man. So with that being said, you guys want to start getting more into the whole financial literary space? Is that For right? sure. For sure. What kind of things are you guys looking to teach? I mean, uh, looking to have other experts teach, like yourself. I love to have uh, wholesale and brought to our community. Mm-hmm. Um, the medical industry, because, you know, like recession-proof industries. Okay. The medical industry. Um, something that I really want to push that's the next wave um, is UGC. I don't know if you heard about it, user-generated content. Mm-hmm. And TikTok ushered this in. Nobody's paying actors and actresses. If you notice, a lot of actors and actresses are having a hard time. Yeah. What's happening is if you if you if you have a brand like these shirts we were talking about, yep. and they see you keep buying them, they'll have you shoot a commercial on your phone in your room, and they'll pay you for it, and they may use that for their ad now. This this is what this is why like Instagram, Facebook, and Google are having a hard time because TikTok is like washing them because they're using real people for for everything. Yeah. Right. Even to prove that UGC works, I tried it out running ads only on TikTok for the bureau bullies. And sales went through the roof mm. because people want to see real people. 
So what I'm seeing the next wave is user generated content. I want to have, I want to teach that. You know, I've pushed a lot of people, all, a lot of people's children in our community. I've got them in the TikTok ads. It's the next wave. Bro. Right? Content is everything. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I ask every entrepreneur that's on my podcast is why is content so important, right? Mm. I never realized how important it was probably until this year. Mm. I'm somebody who's always shied away from it because Word. I'm an introvert Word. and I've never been comfortable in front of the camera. I've never Word. been comfortable just speaking, period. Word. And now that I understand the power of content, right, the power of branding yourself, branding your company, it's something that I know, like, in the way I look at it now, it's like you're almost being selfish. Mm. If you have that's something true, that, that's, that's true. you know, that you know that can help somebody, and you're not out there giving game on and giving value to the people, to me, that's just selfish, More. right? Like, you're always going to have those mental battles within yourself. Mm. Right? And it's just something that you just, you got to overcome. We're all going to have anxiety, More. right? More. It's about controlling the anxiety, not letting the anxiety control you. Mm. And so I want to touch on that, bro, because just like right now what we're doing, this is a form of content. We're More. shooting this podcast. We're letting the people know, hey, listen, you got bad credit. It ain't the end of the world. More. You need to know your rights as a consumer, right? right? And so content, bro, why, in your opinion, is content so important? Because you've been out here shooting content. You got your own podcast, right? Yeah. yeah. So why is content so important? Um, I think that we can look this a few ways, but my favorite way to look at it is, um, and we briefly touched on this when we spoke a few days ago, um, people connect with stories, Mm. That's been, you know, you look, go in the caves and you'll see stories on the wall. Human beings uh, connect to stories. Even scripture is a story. You want to connect the hearts to people, you tell stories. And if somebody connects to that story, they connect with you. Yeah. So you ever hear, yeah, I'm pretty sure you've heard some of your, I'm a lot of my mentors say it. I know you probably heard your mentors say it, you know, pretty much find your tribe or mm -hmm. they'll find you. But they can't, you know, if you're not, if you're not telling people what you sell, they don't know, you know, nothing's for sale at that point. Yep. So for me, why content is so important is because people get to see what you do. And if this is what they like, they'll come to you. Right. But if we're not showing them, then, you know, there's no way, you know, we, we're not even helping ourselves at that point, yeah. let alone helping them. But I think it's really important because human beings just love stories, bro. Yeah, you know, man. why do we go to the movies? Why do we watch TV? Even if, you know, most of, most of it is because we're seeing ourselves in the story, but people just love stories. Yeah, man. It's it's sales and marketing, bro. Yeah. It's like you're selling yourself, you're marketing yourself yeah. at the same time. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like people want to see what you got going on. Like we're no longer in that age of, you know, hiding. Yeah. Right? Nowadays it's almost like people look at you if you're hiding, like you got something wrong with you. Like yeah. you, you're hiding something yeah. bad, right? Yeah. The the old ways with what we were taught growing up was be humble. Yeah. Shut the hell up. Yeah. <laughs> If you <laughs> speak about what you do, you're almost bragging, in yeah. a way, right? And now it's like that's not the case. Yeah, I mean, we we live on social media more than we actually live in our real life now. I mean, it's Bro. just reality. Yeah, man, it's just reality. Yeah, and so, yeah, man, content is so crucial, bro. It's um, I think it's it's the the new wave, like yeah. you said, it's the way of the world, and it's really what's gonna people are gonna be more drawn to content creators for sure. And I really hope, you know, the youth that's watching this understands, like, the power in content. Yeah. Because branding yourself is just, it's so important nowadays. Even if you're not selling anything yet, start selling yourself. Yeah. You, eventually, you're going to run into something you want to sell. Well, I mean, even if you don't have no value to give, start a podcast. Or, right? It's just that simple. Be huh? curious. <laughs> yeah. Like, interview people like yourself or, and myself or, that have something to give and ask questions. Or, that, that was my thing when I started my entrepreneurial journey was like, I was so curious. Word. I wanted to know things, right? Mm. And starting a podcast is one of the best ways to do that. Word. You don't have to be the expert. No. You're the guy that gets asked the questions to, to find out how, the what yeah. and the how, right? Yeah. And so I think the audience just needs to know that it's like, start with a podcast, man. And to ask questions. Yeah. Ask questions. It's the perfect way to brand yourself and it's the perfect way to like get out there. Yeah. That's so that's so heavy you what you're saying, bro, because like, you know, if you ever look on Instagram, everybody's, you know, when people release the list of books you should read, you know, mm -hmm. Rich Dad, Poor Dad and uh, Think and Grow Rich. What they fail to look at with those authors is that these weren't the guys that were rich. These were the guys asking the questions. Mm. 
Dale Carnegie, Napoleon Hill, Robert Kiyosaki. They were just asking questions. Yeah. Right. And it's, that, that was when, so when I, when I read those books, that's what I would see. Like, so the best, if you want to be successful, ask questions. So bro, speaking of books, are you a book reader? Or, so like myself, it's hard for me to read. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be crazy to say it right now. A lot of people are be like, what the F? Like, <laughs> but I've only read one book my entire life. What was it, bro? So it was Holes. The, the remember the movie yeah. holes? <laughs> I read it in, in seventh grade. <laughs> it's the only book I've ever read, man. <laughs> Seven, you know that book. <laughs> but I think what everybody needs to realize is how honest you're being, bro. Because you could have lied and been like, yeah, you know, like everybody else does. Hey, you need to read seven books a day and yeah. start an LLC and all yeah, that. And not to brag about myself, but I've done pretty well over the last few as years. we can see. Word, yeah. word. but. Books, man. Are you a reader? Big time. I, you know, um, mostly because I spent so much time alone, I fell mm-hmm. in love with books. Okay. Um, but what you're saying is so heavy, bro. And I, it looks like I want to really touch on, like, you know, entrepreneurship ahead, is not a one size fits all thing. It's yeah. not like, you know, everybody gives like, you know, when people give their idea of success, you know, if it was working, like people claim was, then we wouldn't need to be on Instagram doing anything. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I'm saying that to say once people give their um, advice on the Internet, it's always uh, everybody's seen this, uh, you know, read books in the morning, meditate, wake up at 5 a.m. Yeah, that's all you that's see. It's the most cliche it's thing so cliche. in the world right there. Bro. But then when you start to meet the billionaires, they're not doing that. Yeah. You know, I, um, I think it was um, I don't want to lie on them. I'm not, I'm not going to say a name. Cause I was probably going <laughs> to I think I'm mix, I'm mixing them up. Right. No, no, it was. It was Mark Cuban. He's, he doesn't wake up that early. Mm. Right, he's one of my favorite people. He doesn't wake up very early. Um, Jeff Bezos, you know, um, he doesn't wake up. You know, and, and another thing people miss is okay, every billionaire. If you ever notice, like um, Mark Zuckerberg wears the same thing every day. Mm. These guys make minimal decisions every day. So my issue with people saying do those things they're claiming is by the time it hits time for you to make a decision, you've already made a hundred. So you don't have the energy to make decisions to be an entrepreneur anymore. Mm. Right. So what I liked about the billionaire and some of what you just said, and then the guys that are actually successful are saying is like, you know, find what works for you and be happy exactly. with that. All this extra, like I don't read because of the internet. I just it's just something I fell you in love it. with. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's actually one of my hobbies. Yeah. And I'm not sitting up. I'm not gonna sit here and lie like I'm sitting up reading entrepreneurship, but I might read sex books. Like I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I'm just reading, bro. It's just right. fun to me. But it's like once you find your, your success is whatever works for you, not yeah. what. And that's why a lot of people aren't successful because they're trying to like put themselves in this box when you know nothing in life. This, this even oxygen is not one size fits all. We're breathing different oxygen. Mm. Everybody has a tailor-made thing just for them. So that especially applies to the lanes we're in. Yeah, man. I, I've tried the whole reading book thing. <laughs> I'll probably read like two chapters and I just <laughs> mentally check out. I'm just like, oh, I can't. I can't pay attention. My mind starts just wandering off. But what I will say, because people are probably like, well, how the hell did you learn the stuff that you know? Or, so for me, YouTube University, or, like, I'm more of a visual type of learner mm. right i want to like see you when you're telling me something mm. i want you to show me how you did it right mm. and then podcasts listening to podcasts that's my one of my favorites right? like audio stuff i've tried the audio books too haven't gone far with the audio yeah. books either <laughs> but podcasts you know having conversations like this Word. um getting in you know with masterminds getting in those same rooms asking the detailed questions mm. because a lot of things like you got to think about too is like if you go read a book, right? I can't remember a damn thing I read in Holes. <laughs> I didn't retain that information, man. I only know because of the movie, bro. I'm not I even mean, gonna lie to you. You got to be really passionate about something to retain that information. Yeah. You got to really know it and you got to read it multiple times, yeah. right? It's a lot of times not going to come to you at one time. Mm. But yeah, so for me, what works is like podcasts, watching videos, having natural conversations. Well, that's what. So, what are your your top books that you've read? Um, entrepreneurship or just in general? Just in general. In general, the ones that changed my life. Um, How to win friends and influence people. Okay. Um, and That's just important. Oh my goodness! And and I would I could just give a brief because I read it over a million times. I'm one of those people. I don't just read it once. I read it a few times. Yeah. Um, like I said, you read it multiple times. Multiple right? times, yeah. The information. So I would say um, the biggest takeaway I got from that was always memorize people's names. 
Mm. You ever meet, you know, you've been around some successful people. You ever notice how, you know, everybody's identity, your brand and life is your name. People's yeah. name means everything to them. Yeah. So um, one of the billionaires that he interviewed, and this is back in the 50s, um, better yet, no, this wasn't even beautiful. This is JFK, the president. He oh, would wow. he would meet you, ask your name, write it down, read it a few times, and then throw it away. And then oh, he, wow. so he he knew everybody's name, the janitor, everybody. He knew their name. I never knew that. About right, him, Fifty man. Cent is somebody who I really like because they said that he goes in rooms. Everybody knows he's Fifty Cent. He's still gonna come introduce himself and learn your name. Right. So the most the, the the most important takeaway from that book. Well, I, actually, I'll give two. One was to learn people's names, mm -hmm. and if you want to go further, learn their birthday. And another thing was create competition. There was a guy in a factory who he talks about in the book who um, his people were slacking, so they were losing money. So he went in the middle of the floor and drew a number in the floor. Mm. And employees like, what is that? And then the next day he drew another number. He was creating competition, but, you know, they never actually asked him what he was doing. They assumed he was keeping track of who was doing the best, so everybody started doing well. Oh, wow. So that's actually something my institute in my team is like, you know, healthy competitions human beings needed to keep them going that's smart man. right so so those are two takeaways from that book um a book after that that i really liked um 50 cent has a book um called hustle harder hustle smarter mm -hmm. i mean that book is insane it's like i would say it's on the level of a rich dad poor dad people just aren't reading it it is insane like mm -hmm. it's like um he gives so much game in that book it's crazy um he, one of the things i learned in that book was when you're with human beings and you want to, um, you know, if you can get people to emotionally buy into whatever you're talking about, you've yeah. got them for life, which is, you know, that's, that was the biggest thing with the Bureau Boys. People emotionally bought in, yeah. right? But one of the things he taught when you're in person with people is to touch them. Mm. Anything you're talking, touch them. But you're not, you know, preferably on the arm. Um, and once you do that, you trigger an area in their brain that triggers the area for love. Mm. So the person automatically buys into whatever you're saying after that. See, bro, I don't, I don't need to read the book because now yeah. I just got game from you. <laughs> that, but that's that's literally like an email. I prefer, and I, another reason I like to read is, and, you know, even like, again, people's strength. So if Renee tell you, if she don't want to read something, she'll just send it to me. Mm. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, we lean on this. We human beings, we need each other. We lean yeah. on each other's strengths. I'm not in the wholesaling, but I have a friend that is. I'm not about to try to go learn the whole thing. I'm just going to call yeah. you. Hey, Justin, what do I do about this? Yep. You know what I mean? It, it's no reason to be trying to reinvent the wheel and try to, a person that knows everything hasn't learned anything. Yeah. Right. Um, and then a number three, so many, Justin, which one would I have to put? <laughs> and it was really hard to put those two, but I was just contagious by Jonah Berger. Mm. All my marketing comes from that book and I'll give that one away too. Um, people buy in the social currency. What makes them look cool? Nobody actually cares about your product. What makes me look the best? So for instance, you know, if you look on Instagram, people are posting their food. The food makes them look rich. It's, they're going to post a steak, whatever. So there was this guy. He was a big time chef. His restaurant still in Philly. And I, it's actually on my to-do list. I haven't gone yet. Um, and he, he, he wasn't from Philly. He says, I'm going to go to Philly and sell a cheesesteak. Everybody in Philly selling cheesesteaks. So his friend's like, that's not impossible. He didn't. So what the guy ended up doing was he went and got the most expensive cuts of beef he could find and started selling a hundred dollar cheesesteak. So now he's the Gucci of cheese. Everybody's bought, Oprah bought cheese. Everybody's, and the cheese didn't taste any different. They just wonder why he thought he was crazy enough to sell it for $100. Which is why I ended up selling books for $500. Just, you know, if you can, and you know, as long as people are talking, you've done something right. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, that's social currency. Because now that I've bought this $100 cheese stick, I look cool to all my friends because I had a $100 cheese stick. That's contagious in a nutshell. Oh, that's powerful. Bro. Yeah. You make me want to go read a book now. I'm telling you, bro, <laughs> if you do want to read, I, I mean, I could just tell the books to you whenever we speak, but if you do want to read and you, you, you know, you want to take like, um, I mean, you're already a highly intelligent dude, but you just want to take like little things with human being, you know, because everything we do is human interaction, whether it's Instagram or in person. If you want to take those to the next level, those three books right there. Yeah. And, no, and I live you, by those things there. Just hearing what you were saying about those makes it intriguing. They got yeah. the audio version of this? Um, yeah, and 50 Cent does his audio book himself. It makes it even better, bro. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My thing is just being able to engage and pay attention. Bro, it's, time, bro. it's... You know, if you really want to learn how to control a crowd, my speaking methods come from Dave Chappelle. Really? Yeah. Wow. Dave Chappelle. I learned everything about speaking from Dave Chappelle. Yeah. No, he's actually real. I don't think people catch on. He's that, not dude. a he's comedian, bro. He's a yeah. he's a guy that makes life funny. He's very good at telling stories. Yeah. And the best salesmen, the most engaging, most people engaging. Yeah. Are he's, the ones that can tell. And he's stories. a history buff. Mm. So again, he's telling stories. Yeah. And yeah, he's amazing. Man. I've never seen in my life. I don't think I've ever seen anybody control a crowd like that. Yeah, bro. Yeah, That's, he's amazing. 
Yeah, and he can control crowds from all different like aspects of life. Bro. You'll have um we gotta hit one of those Dave Chappelle shows together, bro, when he tours again. Yeah. You'll have uh Mexicans, white people, black people, Indians, yeah. and he's engaging them all. He's he's joking on all of them. It's and it's like, I mean, there are cultural things that it's really like, you know, when I, when you go overseas, um, you know, for instance, I was in Medina, Saudi Arabia in April. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to find a place to get a COVID test so we could leave. And I'm walking in the middle of the night, and these Russian guys are in Medina. Mm-hmm. Now, you know me. I'm from the inner city. You know, it's hard to trust anybody. Yeah. They're like, come here. And so my guard is, I'm by myself, no weapon, nothing. All I have is a bag. All I have is my bag. And I'm like, what does this guy want? He's like, they're like, come here. And they all come out. Like, come here. But, you know, I can feel their energy. They weren't up to anything. They just wanted me to come in and eat with them. So I'm saying, like, and I sat there and ate with my hands with these guys. Oh, wow. Right? Russian guys. We didn't even speak because I couldn't speak the language. We ate and then I left. They just wanted me to eat with them. Saying that to say, you know, the the real sign of a genius level man like Dave Chappelle is the fact that he can like accept culture and understand other people's culture and then make them laugh at their culture to what everybody understands. It's like insane. I just want sometimes I watch his stuff, not even a laugh, just to just to learn. Like it's like it's like a master class almost. Yeah, bro. He's he's very like articulate on stage and he knows how to capture your attention. What I learned from him was his dramatic pauses. Uh, when he wants to, his explanation points are pauses. I learned that from him. So even, you know, um, I actually critique myself really heavy. The speech I just gave in New York, um, which is actually one of the biggest events I've been invited to. Um, the speech I gave in New York, I, I told my cameraman, I'm going to institute the Dave Chappelle pauses. And so I was actually just watching the video, just counting how many I did. But what I noticed was when I did that, the crowd engaged more. Every time I did that, people were like, you know, the biggest issue I was having with my speeches was mm and uh. And so what I learned, I actually um, got into a class for this on Udemy.com, um, $9. Um, and the way to stop that is in a way to make yourself look more intelligent is to pause and make look like, look like you're thinking. Mm. So if I'm talking, I'll say, yeah, Justin. So I said, mm, I'll stop. I look more intelligent now because you think I'm, people, if the, the mere fact that people think you're thinking makes you look more intelligent. You know what I've noticed about all the high level entrepreneurs that I've been around is they're all observant. Bingo. They all pay attention. They're very aware of their surroundings. Yes. And I used to look at that as like a gift because I'm very observant. My Mm. wife is very observant. Mm. Like usually the quiet person in the room is typically observing the shit out of the room, which makes them very aware. And that's, that's something I'm starting to realize now is like so many high level entrepreneurs have that trait. Mm. Is they're just they're aware. Or, they observe a lot. Or, but man, what I really want to ask you now, dude, is like, one, are are you married? No, nah, you're nah, not married. Nah. You, got, you got a kid? Yeah, one son. Yeah. So, do you have any kind of issues with work life balance? Yeah, because you know I was a, uh, I I am I was a full time my, my first um two years in entrepreneurship I was a single father. Okay. So when Renee and them met me, like a lot of it, they were trying to help me because I didn't understand what I was doing. Mm-hmm. My son didn't have a bedtime. Like, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're up all night, yeah. especially when you have a crying one-year-old. So um, this kid would go to sleep at 4 or 5 a.m. I didn't know nothing about a bedtime. Nobody was mm-hmm. telling me that. Renee and them, we used to text me, like, you ain't got to put him to sleep. And I was like, you got to do what? I don't mm-hmm. have a bedtime. Um, so that was like a huge struggle for me. You know, there's actually a video of my dad. I, uh, we had it on the internet at one point. I'm probably going to put it out because I'll, I'll be putting some other content out where he says, um, he remembers coming to the house and I was, he said he used to watch me read and study 18 hours a day with a crying baby. He said that on stage at one of our events. And, you know, when you're going through that kind of stuff, you, I don't think you notice the magnitude of um, what's going on. And I'm one of those people who even later, I don't realize until somebody says something because I'm too busy uh, looking for solutions. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I, I was, uh, I was, I'm still a full time father. My sister helps me out a lot now, like a whole lot. I really got to give, uh, uh, I really got to pay homage to my sister, man. She helps me because our sons are around the same age. And I mean, I wouldn't be able to do the things I do if she didn't step up the way she did. Yeah, bro. It's work life balance, like with me, because I'm married, I got three kids. It's, it's something that I've battled with. Mm. And sometimes I feel like I'm doing too much business wise mm. and not really doing enough with the kids. Mm. Like I have such this high standard because of the foundation that my father laid. Wow. Like my father wow. was a head coach for all of our sports teams. Wow. 
He would leave work early to make sure he got to our games on time. Mm. And so it's like he set that that standard for us. And but my dad was never an entrepreneur. Mm. He was working for somebody, mm. right? So when you're an entrepreneur, you work around the clock. Bar. Right? It's a no days off. Four seven job. Bar. And if you want food on the table, you want the bills paid, it's hard to say, hey, F this. Or, <laughs> let me focus on the family. Or, and so it's something that I battle with, man. And so it's, it's a question I like to ask people that come on here is like, you know, work-life balance. Like, do you have a family? How are you dealing with it? And so, yeah, dude, it's it's something that I battle with. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure out to this day. I feel like I've gotten a lot better at it. Yeah. But... That in itself, bro, is, is so interesting because, you know, um, when you're a leader, when you're a man and a leader, um, you, you know, you don't have the option of being indecisive. Mm. And every decision comes with consequences, yeah. good or bad. So it's like, you know, even we're talking about work-life balance, it's like a man has to have a direction. And with that direction is a decision. And it's we're going this way and we accept whatever comes with it. So everything has this, um, has this uh, what is it, I guess? caveat right mm -hmm. it's like you know i could spend all day with my kids but then how am i gonna feed them right or i can feed them you know what i what it what it brings me to is you know gandhi's kids hate him they say you saved the world but you forgot to save us mm -hmm. so whenever i feel like i'm going too far with the bureau boys like well how like i've been on the road for a minute right now and it's like while well, i'm rushing back to my son within the next few days it's like I always remember hearing Gandhi's kids say that, like, yeah. damn, you know, he's a hero to the world, but his family didn't love him. Yeah, and so it's so interesting you say that that's something that I battle with, like, you know, and it's sometimes like you can't find a balance. Yeah. Um, you know, I took, you can take the kids. I took my son on the road with me one time and um, it irritated him a lot. Like, you know, he's still, a, he's five at the time. He was like three. It was just too much for him. Yeah. And so again, and now it's okay. I want him to have him with me the whole time, but he's still a baby. It's too much for him. So it's like finding that balance is tough. I think that's the for for a father like yourself that actually cares about their children. I think it's always going to be the biggest struggle. Yeah. It's like you know, I want to feed them, but then I want to spend time with them. And until you know you reach the level where the money's just printing itself, which it does, but it like you reach that level where it's like um, you know, I don't know, Elon Musk or somebody, or just make money in your sleep. Yeah. Make money in your sleep. Freedom. And then even men, you know, but when you're passionate about something, at that point, it's not even about the money. It's just pursuing your passion. Yeah. Then it's like, you know, now I want to use my passion to free everybody else. You know what I mean? It just It's like a never-ending tunnel almost. Yeah, bro. So, man, I want to ask you one more thing, dude. It's, you know, we're in December of 2022. We're about to hit 2023. Like I said earlier, these last two years have been real easy on entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. And we're about to separate the men from the boys. Yes, sir. Where do you see Umar and the Barrel Bullies going? And I know you said what you guys want to accomplish, yeah. what you want to do for the people. But I guess the better way to form this is, is do you see a recession coming? And if you do, how do you guys plan on preparing for that? We're in one. Do I think it's going to get worse? I mean, the trucking industry is taking a huge hit right now. So that's going to affect all of us. Um, they're, they're getting ate up. But I don't think enough people are speaking on that. I mean, it's bleeding. Um, we're in one. Um, but, what you know, what I see and what all the people in the credit industry see is a prime opportunity to serve. Mm. If you serve, you're probably going to become, if you know, most of them are millionaires already, like they claim on the internet. You're going to, be a millionaire 20 times over and, and this is why I'm saying that people are going to get in more debt don't charge them make their, make it free which is why we're going to do the free credit repair mm. because your money will come on the back end from actually beating the debt collector this is where you're really going to separate see who's actually doing the things they preach yeah. right and so this is something we've been preparing for for a minute I just had to add more people to the team because there was no way that the, the way that I see us doing it there was no way we could do it unless we had enough people to do it but this is a prime opportunity to make a lot of money serving and charge people nothing mm. you know the more people you free the more free you are be a problem solver for sure so you know percent. so recession which is a prime opportunity in every sector yep. um, I think the only thing that's really 
I mean, I'm really interested interested to see how Joe Biden's going to fix this. Uh, not to make the podcast political, but I'm really interested to see how he's going to fix the trucking thing because it's taking a heavy hit. But I'm saying all that to say, like, you know, in real estate credit, which I feel like are pretty much synonymous, is like mm-hmm. um, this is a prime opportunity to solve people's problems for free on the front end, get your get an agreement or whatever with them on the back end for whatever remedy y'all get, and then use that to buy up real estate, which is about to be really cheap soon. Yeah, man, and that's exactly why I wanted you on the podcast because a lot of people, you know, that are watching this probably like, well, you're more into real estate. Why are, you, why are we talking about credit? <laughs> credit is freaking important when it yeah. comes to real estate. Yeah. You need to understand credit. You need to understand consumer law and sure. know your rights. So how can people get a hold of you? How can they find you, bro? Um, Instagram, at the Bureau Bullies. TikTok, at the Bureau Bullies. We have a Facebook group. Our Facebook community just hit 11,000, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, Credit the Truth by the Bureau Bullies. Um, a lot of people, you know, uh, our, the book that changed the game is free now. No upsells, no gimmicks. Just go download that. And then we have a lot of free resources in the Facebook group in the file section. Go in there and use everything. And then soon we'll have the free credit repair. Yeah, guys, listen, this guy has gave so much game, not just in this podcast, but he's got so much free game on Instagram, YouTube, like so many platforms. So if you guys have credit issues, I highly suggest you tapping in with Umar and the Bureau Bullies. They will get you right. Um, but guys, I appreciate you guys joining us for this episode. Please like, share, subscribe, comment your favorite part. And until then, I will see you guys on the next episode. See you. Thank you, bro.